actually rolling. Okay, sweet. Episode whichever we're on, we're back. There's a clap. Gotta have it. <laughs> Yay, yes. Yay, we're getting, like, traction, and people are somewhat paying attention to our ramblings about music and everything else. So, we got yeah, that it, it, is, it is funny to look at the statistics, and you're like, oh, we haven't paid attention for a while. And then, yeah. uh, then you're like, oh, there's still people listening all the time. So, thank you. Yeah, so thank you to everyone, uh, which is honestly a lot larger than I thought. I'm not going to share any dead numbers on this. Not that they're dead. We're but, up to know. we're up to three. So. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that 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 one person is now two, and that's because they have yeah. two personalities. So <laughs> <clears throat> it has been it, there has been some crazy stuff going on. I mean, it's tough to na- narrow down. Uh, music stuff into a small thing you know we talked yeah. about ai in the last one uh and went into a little bit of details with that stuff and it's only grown to be a little bit more of a problem particularly in no, visual that was that was last year it's so last year i think it's over yeah, no it, it, it's still pretty close it i mean what uh, they just had a huge issue with taylor swift getting ai generated uh images yeah, those, those pictures yeah nf or nsfw yeah not safe for work style of thing and um those uh that one guy with the uh johnny cash ai cover of taylor swift's all right uh, blank space i mean honestly it sounds amazing i that's something where i would pay for the track it was awesome i was like holy cow that is way yeah, what, is, too- what is that that uh there i ruined it is that yeah is that, that one yep except he's like there i made it better <laughs> and he did it was aw- not that it was a bad song to begin with but like the cash cover was like perfect it's if if I wouldn't have known it was somebody else, I would have thought it was one of his. Yeah, I wonder like, though. I mean, you probably watched it on your phone, right? Like you didn't listen to it and. No, and I it... had headphones on. Oh, uh, okay. I, I heard it once, and I'm like, okay, plug. Nice. Okay, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> so, um, that uh, that was awesome, and I kind of like that aspect of the AI. You know, like Freddie Mercury singing Elton John and like all these dead uh, superstars doing covers right. uh, and that we'd never have an opportunity to hear it otherwise. You know, clearly it's somewhat dishonoring to the dead, whatever <laughs> that's worth. You know, it, uh, having uh, those guys do covers that they would never originally do, or at least we think never do. You never kind of know for sure. Yeah. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, some people definitely wouldn't do certain covers of things. Um, I do, I do believe that. I guess the one side is it is the people who do the AI stuff, right? They're learning what mm-hmm. makes like. I'm sure they can identify quickly. They're like that's not real. That's not real. Those like little little tells here and yeah, there. It's gotta be just like hearing a, a slight auto tune. Like I can pick it up on yeah, anything. Sure. Like oh yeah, there it is. There it is. There it is. Because you know what to listen for. It's almost like the probably if you're doing the arranging of AI stuff in the sense of mixing it down or whatever, you're hearing all the defects continuously so it's easy to pick it out in another scenario. Sure. And well, and then one of the things I noticed is that means they'll be good at detecting when people are trying to fake something for real. Mhm. So if somebody's then, like, yeah, this is real and they'll be like, "That's eh, not real because of da 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 da." So there's a little bit of like, it's kind of like the cybersecurity stuff. Yeah. The, uh, you know, there's a lot of people working on like quantum computers and stuff like that because they can decrypt things. But you could also create things to create create encryptions with quantum computers eventually, which means that it's always yeah, an arms. There's there's always like yeah, who's running ahead or whatever. So everyone's sort of winning. I am I'm looking at the Cavs game. I'm a big Cavs fan. Cavaliers. Mm-hmm. If for those people not in the United States, all all two of you, um, <laughs> it's the NBA team from Cleveland, but they are winning one hundred six to one hundred one right now with nineteen seconds to go. So I think we're good. I think you're, I think you're pretty solid there. Uh, that's enough of a lead, but who knows? You know, it's uh, Cleveland has been known to blow spectacular leads at times. So it's true. And, so is Buffalo, but I'm um, neither nor when when all, with all those things, you know. Uh, Sam was totally. Oh, my right. son's they didn't make it, right? They didn't. Yeah, he was crushed when the Bills lost, and I'm like, "How are you a Bills fan? I mean, I'm from that area, but uh, I don't watch football at all. Like, not yeah. even voluntarily." <laughs> 
Somebody like, somebody invited me to a game. They had like 50 yard line just about on the field seats. And they're like, yeah, you should come. It's a great time. You know, I got extra tickets. You should come. And I'm like, dude, I, I really appreciate the offer. Thank you for bringing me into your inner circle. And I'm telling you right now, I'm the last guy you want at a football game. Like, I'm already apathetic to begin with. Yeah. And then you drag me out of my comfort zone and place it so I have to watch it without the comforts of home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm that much of a snob. It's like, boy, this is not going to work. So thank you, but invite somebody else that will have a good time. You know? Sure. And uh, whatever. I mean, we're still friends, but it will, <laughs> that was <definitely laughs> That like... was the end of that friendship. <laughs> exactly. And now we're down to two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was the guy that left st- stopped listening to the, the podcast. So um, the AI thing is definitely – it's going to be interesting. Like the, the court battles have been there, and the development of it is getting better. I, in terms of detection, I agree with you on the uh, – you're going to have people that are re- just be able to tell by ear when something is completely yeah. fake or not. And then did, did you, you see, see that? that uh, oh, go ahead. Yep. <laughs> did you see the uh, how to convince everybody you weren't there? It's an extra finger ring. So it f- makes it seem because AI generated photos, they, they usually have a mistake of like an extra finger on the hand oh, or right. something weird like that. So they're like, buy your extra ring or extra finger ring. So you oh, wear, nice. it looks like they have an, and it's like, right. you're not really there. It's all AI. You can argue. <laughs> killed that person because no i wasn't there look at the day i generated yeah, that, that, that's obviously not real yeah that's funny <laughs> i was like that's pretty good i was going somewhere totally different with my comment which was did you hear that song that went around like the first day i generated pop song or whatever and everyone listened to it and they're like i don't think we have anything to worry about for a little while <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't be surprised you know because it was I, like it was it's funny because it sort it sounded professional, and it like had a lot of like the pop hooky whatever things going in it, you know. Like, it, but it was there's there's just the huge like you you could just tell that it wasn't very good, yeah. you know. I will so. admit I do listen to the AI generated prog channel on YouTube. Oh yeah, like it, all twenty four seven AI generated prog. Rock. That's all you yeah. listen to anymore. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I've been on a big Bach kick in the car, but um, with the the prog AI thing, generated uh, Bach. Uh, let's not go there. <laughs> no, I, actually, that's an old. I think I mentioned that before. That was something that they did on the 3DO, but um, which is an old gaming system like pre Sega Saturn. Oh, they, I remember it sort of. Yeah. Yeah, but um, the uh, it was actually like the gent art AI generated stuff was actually pretty cool it's fun to work out to you know, you know it satisfies the ADD so wait, it's like so you can listen to gent without like the emo singing parts <laughs> pretty much yeah I, I avoid the singer you know um i've it? never really understood that that genre i, I know it's not everyone but it, it yeah. practically is everyone well you know what is this band uh my buddy who I would never expect to listen to this style is like, Oh, you should check out this band sleep token. Like two years ago, he's like, you gotta, you gotta sh- check out sleep token. And I'm like, all right. And I filed it into things. I'll eventually get around to, but yeah. I know his musical taste, so I don't trust it <laughs> type of thing. <laughs> and, uh, it finally they came up in like one of my feeds on something. And I'm like, what are, okay. God, somebody told me about these guys. I think somebody told me, I'm pretty sure it's these guys. Cause there's sleep token. And then there's sleep theory. Which sleep theory is a, a different. <laughs> they're so band. Cre- they're so creative. All these bands. I know. There's a lot of things to fall asleep to apparently, but uh, sleep theory is like what if an R and B singer merged with like a a metal band type of thing, but not Metallica metal, more of the anthem metal, for lack of a better term. And it's hmm. it's kind of cool. Like I like that some of the songs are great. Uh, other ones are definitely like the the whole John Five thing. Phenomenal chops, really good at metal, really good at country. Fusing the two doesn't really do it, – it's not the fusion that I would be thinking of of it. Anyways, so there's Sleep Theory, which I, I was confused, and finally I texted him. I'm like, hey, was it Sleep Token you were telling him about? He's like, yeah. And I'm like, all right. So I checked him out, and uh, it was – when they have a hook, man, it is awesome. And it's so random because they'll do the screaming metal and – high floaty vocals and a little bit of rap and R&B in the same track, you know, in five minutes, which is very interesting to me personally, because it's like, okay, that's cool. I mean, 
I'd like to hear more of the hook more than once, but at the same time, you play the track again. So there you go. Uh, so I, I like that. And they do the, I mean, they're doing the whole, like, you know, the mask wearing metal thing. You know, everybody's in a costume. And they don't want their IDs to be known. And there's a current controversy because somebody doxed them. Like somebody was able to figure it out and put it out, which is totally stupid. Like, why the hell would you do that? It's not like they're politicians or whichever it's they're musicians yeah. and they're like it's on our privacy oh by the way here's everything about them <laughs> okay well thank you for that you know we've only right. done this for however many years and not had a huge thing and uh that's crazy and they were coming to town and uh, somebody checked out tickets and they were like 200 bucks a pop and i'm like you guys ain't that big to be charging 200 dollars a pop like huh. that that was shocking to me i'm like you're that was, that was the normal price ticket that was like the average ticket price i don't so even not think like, like meet and greet thing i don't even think like a lot of famous bands are that expensive well, yeah dude my buddy just posted on facebook he was looking to get tickets to go see uh what's her face um olivia rodriguez yeah 700 bucks for no nosebleed seat <laughs> well i believe that i who the hell is she i don't know who she oh is. really no oh, she's <laughs> mad she's massively popular Okay, well, With, I mean, like, it tells you what I listen to, but... Well, like, we talked about that, I think, before, which was the... Yeah. It's, it, like, the way trends work, right? It's, like, all dictated by 13 to, like, 18-year-olds. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's, that's what's popular, like, whatever they like, and that they all very much like Olivia Rodrigo. I just can't believe it's $700, so, for, like, a Well, nose- they probably weren't that initially... Well, that's the, those, so those there, those tickets sell out like so fast, because, exactly, and, that's and then they get resold for a zillion dollars. Yeah, so that's, that's not even like, going to her, which you know that's lame. Even another layer of bullshit. But well, then there's the uh, somebody who remarked, "Yeah, it's the AI ticket scalpers." Yeah, the, if they're using that to go in so, and buy all the tickets. I know because uh, my <laughs> wife and daughter they went to Taylor Swift in Pittsburgh. Which, if you could imagine, she did two nights there at the uh, football stadium, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it sold out in like less than a minute or whatever. <laughs> but they were able, like, she was trying to combat it be, with by giving, like, if you were part of this membership thing or whatever, you get like to be the first to put your name in there. Yeah. But like, my wife or my sister-in-law and like somebody else, like it's like five people were trying to get it and only one of them got it and then bought all the tickets, Yeah, yeah, yeah you yeah. know, for the group of like seven of them or whatever. Um, but I know it, it's a problem because it, it's like an, they instantly get bought and then instantly are on StubHub or whatever else to resell them for like four or five times the amount they bought them for. And people pay it, first of all, Secondly, it, yeah. How do you stop that? Like, how outside of? Like, I think they were really struggling, and they, well, so I think what Taylor Swift was saying, and it, but it seems like it didn't didn't fix anything. But she was like, I don't think we can trust you know Ticketmaster. Like, you guys need to sort this out. Like, this is supposed yeah. to be the thing you're good at. This is what you get paid all this money for, and you can't do this. Like, you can't even do your job. <laughs> you yeah. Know? The one you know, the one thing that you actually do, not like this. <laughs> holding holding artists and venues hostage like not that part but the uh, the actual well, transaction it, thing that yeah the thing that that everyone's paying you for you can't manage yeah well that's what happens when you have a monopoly on everything like they've literally bought up yeah. all the comp there's a couple of small competitors but they're so insignificant that they can't yeah you can't them. there's not they don't have any of the they have all the big venues yep and it's funny because when you they they went to quarter or whatever. I don't know if you remember that. They're like, well, we only have ten percent of the venues, you know, or whatever. It's by like yeah, well, like by TV. numbers, because they're like, well, you know, if you go to um, Akron, there's five hundred and seventy four venues. Yeah. <laughs> we just happen to have three of them, you know. Yeah. You're like, well, the, the three largest the and most players. lucrative, but whatever. Yeah, the ones that everyone plays at, yeah. Yep. Um, so uh, a friend of mine started a ticket company. I know, that it, but this was years ago, and I don't know what happened to it. I don't think he's still doing it anymore. I think it went uh, went to, uh, as, uh, what was it, from uh, So I Married a Mercurer. <laughs> before. It went tits up, <laughs> as the colonel would say. <laughs> so, uh, but it, the, I don't know for sure. I'd love it if he was successful, but I haven't, I don't really follow him anymore. So just yeah. whichever. 
probably 10 years ago. Um, but so that so this AI thing is like interfering with everything, especially with the tickets. At least we don't have AI performance. <laughs> like there's no nobody up there pressing uh, a button to watch somebody play. Yeah, instrument. but you do have those like holographic things, right? That's all. Yeah, like Frank yeah, Zappa's but... family like had that. Yeah, there was that. The Michael Jackson. Yeah, Tupac, I think Prince uh, too. Maybe even Tom Petty. I think yeah. too. So and that's kind of like at that point. What are you paying for? Like, yeah, nothing. I mean, it, it's not a live show. There's no possibility for error. And if there is an error, it's because they told it to make a mistake. You know, so you're not getting the the live interaction, which goes to the question of what's the the value of going to a live performance. It's the tightrope walk. You know, you know they're probably going to be a hundred percent on. But there's a chance where they could make a mistake, and not that you want to see the mistakes in the sense of enjoying the failure, but you want that experience to realize that they're actually human in the sense of they, they're not that I mean, God you're saying God. that, but that's obviously not true. Well, well in, in what way? I mean, like when you go to I mean, it's a, I mean, that's that people are willing to pay for that other thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, but that's what I, I'm kind of like trying to say that um, why would you pay for the other thing? Because you, it, it's literally just go home and watch a DVD. The, the spectacle. I, I, I get what spectacle. It's all pre-recorded. It is, a, it is a spectacle, I guess. I don't know. To be yeah, at the thing. Yeah. I, don't so know. I to see the hologram. That's great. I can take a couple of pills and see a hologram <laughs> if I really wanted to, <laughs> or whatever. Um, I, I just don't see the the point with that. I mean, but, but that's, that's also a lot like the groups that play it like the cd or whatever you know that yeah if they play it exactly the same as they played it on the album i don't i don't really like, it's not that fun for me to see that no i agree it's uh, i mean it, which is funny as much as i agree with you <laughs> i totally expect to see the same thing that i heard on the album when i go to a classical concert right <laughs> well don't, don't but it, you hope <laughs> if you go see a class let's say, even just pick on classical guitar Sure. There, there's a bit of like working the room and like taking advantage of the room and and the day. So maybe like two months ago you played that set. Or I don't know, even last night you played that set. Whatever you had too much coffee, you're, you're like it was a little up tempoed. The next day you might play a little bit slower. You might or maybe you okay. hear something in the room. That you're like I can milk this a little bit more, right? You're making like these conscious decisions to change the oh, performance okay. slightly. Yeah, yeah I so there, I guess to me there's – and this is true of rock too or whatever, but like you notice it more in classical I think because it's so – there's nothing covering it. There's no lights like shining and yeah, yeah, exactly. there's no like other nuances. But like you, so you notice the little like nuances that they're doing and, uh, you know, you're, they're working the room in a lot of ways, right, as a performer – um, not just a ro- not just a robot that's playing exactly the same thing they played the night before, exactly the same way, in exactly the same clothes, and exactly in the same room, and exactly you know, all yeah. that stuff. So, at least I like to think that that there you know there's actually oh, like I, an inner there's an interaction you know. Oh, totally. I mean, I do that when I, I go to play. If, I, if the room's of obnoxiously live in terms of response. Yeah. When I play, I have to put the brakes on the tempo. How could that be possible? I mean, all the reverb? Come on. <laughs> it's great, unless you, you want to be good and have all the mush thing because it's bouncing all over the place and it's too fast. Um, there now, is such a thing as too live. Would you would ever change your set list for it? Change a set list? Probably not, because that set list is... Because you set it in stone, so pretty, yeah, pretty hard. It's like, can I... Well, like right now I have a program that I'm going to be doing in March and a couple of months after that. You know, or like end of March is my first concert on it, and then I'm going to concertize a bunch with it. But I'll have a couple that I can in replace, but like there's major works in there that are the staple, and then the rest yeah. is just... Well, I think, um, too, like in our current gig state, if you played two times a week every week, you know, or whatever, for the next 10 years, I'm assuming... At that point, you're gonna have like 50 songs under your hands. Oh yeah, and for you sure. can kind of be like, I think tonight we're gonna to do this one. I haven't played this one in a, a month. <laughs> you know, it'd be kind of like 
you know, a little bit like that. You might have like I worked it up today Risky a little bit. Classically, it's like I haven't played this in a month. Let's give it a shot in front of. But a could lot you imagine having that? I mean, it's really too bad that's not a norm. To that is it. no, I, it may be not a norm, but I know somebody that did that. Uh, I forget who it was, but it was a concert in Oberlin, and the guy somebody played a piece for him in his master class. Like he was teaching a master class, and somebody played a piece. He's like, man, I should play that on the concert. I want to play that tonight. Do you have the score? He's like, can I make a copy? I yeah. just got to revisit and like, boom, went out and nailed it. You know, it's a virtuosic piece. And just yeah, sure. I, I actually think, you know, I mean, unless it's like a really like your Carnegie Hall or something, but like, I don't think people mind even at classical shows to be like, hey, I wasn't going to do this tune, but like you guys have been a great audience. <laughs> I was. I think I'm gonna go for it. I'm, hopefully, it goes well. You know, and you kind of do the yeah. thing, and then you've you've like endeared yourself to the audience, and they're also thinking like, "Oh, this is cool! Like, I get to see somebody sort of workshopping a tune and seeing how it's gonna go." Yep. Um, That's what the first concert is with this. I'm, I'm workshopping a couple. Yeah, you know, they go over right. Yeah, concert. I mean, I think if you share that you're doing that, I think people really like that. Like, I know when I if we my group plays or whatever, and I'll say. You know, this is the first time we've ever played this song, like, live or whatever. You see people kind of like, oh, really? Like, I'm at this thing? Like, even if it's, like, a, you know, a small concert, they're like, what? They feel, there's, like, a, they feel special now because it's like, well, oh, they don't just play this all the time? Like, I get to be the first person that hears that? I I think there's something to be said for that. Um, Absolutely. Oh, man. So, the, uh... Like with the the concert set that I'm doing now, it's uh, it's some pieces that most of it is stuff that I've already played. Like the two major, about half the program, you know, Bach and Ponce, two two big works that fills a little bit over half of the program, and the rest is all small little songs that I want to try and do. Yeah. Uh, well, little in the sense of four to five minutes a song, not twenty. So <laughs> it's uh, uh, but that should be fun, and then uh. We'll see where it goes from there. I meant to record it, but I'm having the back buzz on my guitar again, and it's like, seriously? Every single time? I should just constantly tell myself that I'm recording, because that way the back buzz will just either be permanent or finally go away. <laughs> I got I to gotta get this thing looked at. I got to find a... Like, uh, I was mentioning to it... Uh, who was it? Oh, yeah. But the One of the guys I teach with at, at Kenyon, we were talking uh, today for a little bit and he's like yeah you gotta just find that guru that knows you know that really knows how to fix stuff to get in there and to and tweak it and he's like plus it's ohio weather he's like you're 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 bouncing back and forth all the time yeah god for it's it's stable so who knows i I just gotta find someone i was thinking of reaching out to that guy uh tom ford Uh, he's a youtube channel does repairs but you know he's he does repairs where you're it's entertaining to watch because you're scared to death of him breaking the thing in two parts you know like taking the neck off a 1937 martin you know original to reset the neck for the the and 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 it's like (laughs) you're you're sticking putty knives where no putty knives should go on a guitar and he's like and he's like eating a sandwich at the same time exactly you know he's talking to everybody he's like oh yeah and i'm gonna do this and he's got like you know uh oh i don't don't think that should have fallen off It's, I have these extra parts now, so uh, I put it back Interesting. together. Interesting. I've never seen this before. Yeah. yeah. He does say that a lot, but that's usually on like the cheaper harmonies that some guy uh, clearly had it since he was six. You know, wants it restored, and he's like, "You do realize this is going to cost you like, you could buy a top of the line model now yeah, <laughs> for, yeah. to fix this." But you're okay. like, so. you could buy all the harmony guitars. <laughs> exactly for this price. But yeah, it's uh, I, I I gotta find somebody local that can do it in a decent amount. That's the thing, I could find somebody locally that could do it in like six months, but I don't want to be without the guitar. But I mean, I think online too. I I remember that one guitar I wanted to get refretted, and I still haven't done it because the the reputation I heard from some of the local people was not very good. Yeah. So no. um, I found a place that had a great reputation, but it was like. It was like a year or something. You know what I mean? It was online because you go online as soon as it's like they're known online, everyone wants to go, right? Yeah, yeah. So you, you kind of—it's like how do you find the uh, one that's not like that? 
the, yeah. that little virtue to what is it to, 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 you have your instrumental virtuosos that are unknown you need your luthier or uh, repair guy luthier virtuosos that are unknown right. and below the radar um, but uh, that would be nice on that uh, oh uh, to, not to be bouncing around too much because there's so much stuff nom happened or nam nam I guess nom, nom happens. Nom nom. <laughs> nom nom. And nom noms happen. So there's a bunch of food, a bunch of uh, war in the Asia Pacific region. <laughs> and uh, uh, we have the NAM show in, in California with all that fun fun guitar stuff. I, I, that, I, didn't, I didn't pay too much attention. I... Uh, neither did I. But the couple of things that popped out is the one thing that I sent you with that tremolo, which is uh, hmm. with Rick. So, uh, Trump, yeah, right? Rick Tune. <clears throat> yeah, uh, Rick Tune, yeah. Yeah, my buddy. Uh, I I don't think I told you I I saw a, a friend of mine, Chris Bono, great guitar player. Um, he's like buddies with Rick, and he has a bunch of his guitars, and they live in I don't know they live close to each other I think too. Anyway, I saw one of his guitars that had that bridge on it, and I was like, dude, I'm very interested in that. I'm like, it's yeah, got to be a yeah. ton of fun, and he's like, it's it's so much fun. That, so. It's wild because every string bends in tune at the same intervallic rate, yeah. no matter what. And it's not—it's different than a trans trem. You know, we're talking about a new tremolo system that gets a, a minor third going up, and you know, you can probably—is it down a fifth? I can't remember. I, I, forget. I, I, I don't even, i don't think it goes to slack, uh, at least from the demo that I saw. Um, but the guy, it's like it moves it intervallically like that, but it's not like intervallic like the trans trem for the uh, Steinberger, where it was like you you kind of click a switch and everything this tuning uh, thing. Uh, you would you go. could do something with it though. I thought I thought I think the trans trem you can use it like you a whammy bar. I don't know about the whammy bar thing. I'm not sure. All I'm coming from is a reference of when Michael Hedges uses it. Oh. Uh, where he had it like set up for like yeah I, I've seen people like pull up chords like so it sounds like a steel guitar or whatever okay so it probably and maybe it, it, it's very similar I think it's it. pretty similar but yeah and I think that video you sent me it was like well one's really easy to install and use yeah. and the other one's like you gotta maintain it and learn how to use it and all these kind of things yeah. this is um, literally it just looks like a tremolo a longer tremolo like the bot the the sh where a Wilkinson tremolo or a Fender tremolo is like what, like an inch? This is like three inches long. Oh yeah, it, like the way it was the in string there. Trees. Yeah, yeah. They're like the instead of, instead of the whole bridge moving, like that's how most. Yeah, um, do, the bridge doesn't move at all. Yeah, the bridge doesn't move. At all. Also, the the mechanisms inside the guitar. You should look. Yeah, yeah look it up. Rick Tuna, R I C K. You know, R I C K, and then T O O N E. He makes yep. very cool, interesting artsy guitars. Yeah, and stupid expensive, but yeah, cool. very very expensive. Like uh, Ma Matsudo, the the minimalist guitar, which uh, Matsuda, Matsuda, that's it. Um, I love that minimalist guitar. Like I love it. I, I, if I I'm, I'm if I ha yeah. had wealth, that would be like I want one. You know, it just it, but I'm not paying twenty grand for a guitar like that. Right. <laughs> it's like that's yeah, uh, that's cool, but nah. Um, but yeah, so there's that was the tremolo system, which looked really. I just loved the way it sounded. It was it's uh, like a slide in your pocket, for lack of better terms. Sure. And it's I, I can't overemphasize the smoothness of the tuning change when you pull up on the thing or down. It's yeah. like everything moves at the exact same pitch rate. It was really wild. Um, so that was a cool thing that kind of popped out at Nam or Nam. I gotta no no no. I gotta, yeah yeah. You know you, you grow up. Or <laughs> you, you you have a stepfather that was in Nam, and that's where mm. you normally de default to it. Um, but anyways, the uh, uh, overall like there wasn't anything really wild guitar wise. Like at least that I saw. Uh, yeah, know, I saw it, somebody it, had posted something like I. Well, they were there, I think, too, and they were like, "I keep." They're like, "Nothing new is coming out." Yeah, and I'm like, "Well, it is an industry where, like, literally everyone just wants to buy like Strat, Les Paul, and Tally copies." <laughs> and if you are a company that doesn't make those things, your odds of success are extremely low. Yep. And it, 
done it. And there's nothing yeah. wrong because we all love those guitars. You know, those are wonderful. I have a tally copy that's great myself. Um, but uh, yeah, it's kind of it's, it's kind of a bummer for anything like very uh, out there. And then the same with the pedal market. Like so many, how many Tube Screamer clones are there, and Klon clones, and you know, there's not a lot of originality in any of that. Well, it's a matter of how how original can you get before it doesn't become guitar sounding. But even now, there's effects that make your guitar sound crazy. So, yeah, the next step. I mean, the big honestly, the biggest thing that I saw about it was Mateus Mancuso. Like he was freaking everywhere. Everybody, oh, really? Had, yeah, like everywhere. The guy was tearing, and I mean, for good reason. You can tear it up. It's in- incredibly impressive. Everything. I mean, he really just flipped everything on its lid with using his fingers rather than a pick. You know, sure. and playing on guitar. What a win! The, <laughs> the Beato interview with him was fascinating. Like I, no, I didn't watch it. Yeah, it's, I'm it's, sure it's, it's good. He's a great player, obviously. Yeah. Yep. And he, you know, he's really down to earth, and he talked about like how he developed the, that whole thing. And his basic thing was like ignorance. He like had no idea that he could do a lot of stuff with the pick. And his dad was a classical guy, and yeah. he showed him how to do that. So, and he's like, okay, so I'll just do it this way. Sure. You know, and he does the eruption, but he does it with tremolo to do the tremolo picking. You know, he does the AMI the whole time. Yeah. It's just kind of funny. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I guess we could do it. So <laughs> kind of practice my Van Halen licks <laughs> with my. That's right. Um, and you know, they talked about slight things with nail care, and he's like, I keep my nails really short. You know, he's like, it's, I play with nails, but not really. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it's some of the licks that he was doing, though, man, you can only do by doing arpeggiation stuff. Sure. It, it was really just like, that's kind of cool. Like, that's neat to see that level of electric playing push forward with just the, just the fingers. <laughs> sure. Uh, and, yeah, and I mean, that's cool. just another uh, knock on, like, the disadvantage of having YouTube for everything. Because if he had YouTube, YouTube when he first started... He'd have been like, oh, what are they holding in their hand as a pick? And then yeah, he just would have right. became like anyone else. But instead he was like, I don't know how they did that. Let me figure it out. And then kept... Literally, that's what he said he would do. He's like, I'd sit yeah. there, you know, and like, oh, it's this. And just do it yeah. type of thing. That's like you see a lot of the guys from the 80s who were the right age when Van Halen came out. And so many of them came up with like really cool techniques to try to do the Van Halen thing, not knowing what tapping was, right? So they're just like, yeah. "Oh, I just I played it like this," and they do this crazy alternate picking like thing or whatever, and you're like, "Huh?" Like they just they invented their own ways of doing it because no one showed, no one knew, and no one showed them how to do it. Yeah, there, it's like there's an advantage of ignorance to the creative aspect and imitation. Yeah. So trying to imitate something, but you have really no idea outside of you get into a room and it's like, okay, I, I got the sounds. How do I get this exact lick? And so you come up with something that sounds the same, but at the same time, you're discover- moving yourself into a different territory right. while imitating the other guy. And, uh, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. Sure. Do we just have to be I mean, we were, we've talked about this um, because of the thing I've been getting into the last couple of months, but like the uh, um, guitars, like the, the virtuosity on guitar is not, that high really even the really good players compared to most other instruments but it's sort of an advantage too right like the because we're not so like it's not so programmed that this is the way you learn how to become a virtuoso on guitar um like you know do these 12 books and if you get through these books and get to these tempos and get you know get this sound and if you do all those things which is going to take you 20 years you do all that stuff You'll be a virtuoso, you know, but like we don't have that in guitar. But that's how pretty much every other instrument is. Maybe not 20 years, but let's say 10 years of lots and lots and lots of practice. Uh, yep. um, and so we don't have anyone at those levels in a way, but then those instruments don't really have that kind of thing happen where somebody's like, I didn't know you could use, you couldn't use your elbow on the piano or whatever. <laughs> right? Cool. And then. Uh- it was, I think it was Stravinsky that came up with a chord on violin, and the violin player is like, "How the hell do I play that?" And Stravinsky grabbed it and goes like this, Frank, <laughs> and like shows him. The, okay, I guess you're right. So you know, yeah, like, like yeah. So you have to, you need somebody who's like outside of it. So the guitar is full of that, right? All these people that have. Um, That's actually an interesting thing about Segovia. 
isn't it? It is. <laughs> anyway, so like you have um, guitar players that write for guitar, and Segovia. Uh, I just watched. Uh, it was funny. Neil Zaza sent me a link to the, the this like little uh, miniature. Uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, documentary on him. And he, uh, one of the things that Sokovia intentionally did was not allow the composers that he worked with to use a guitar. He's like, don't use it at all. I don't want you seeing it. I don't want you, yeah. like, this, the sustain on this guitar, you know, don't even look at it, you know, <laughs> or whatever, to quote Sinal Tap. But um, he uh, was specifically pushing away from right guitar music on guitar. He's like, write the music and I'll put it on the guitar. Oh, type sure. Of thing. And that uh, that's an, that explains a lot. It also explains why he got along with Rodrigo so so well. <laughs> it's like seriously, dude, you you hate guitar players, but all right, whatever. Uh, sure, but, because it, it's so difficult. But at the same time, we wouldn't have pushed the instrument to the levels that it was that it is now without that. Sure, uh, I mean, you look at the original uh, like fuzz pedals and stuff. It'd be like turn your guitar into a trombone. <laughs> Turn your guitar into a violin or a cello, and it and like that's how the ads were. Yeah, um, really? we don't we don't think of it that way now. We don't think that fuzz sounds like a violin, but in a way, you could see how it could. You might be like, yeah. oh, I could see how that, or see how it sounds like a trombone or whatever. Um, so then that, but even by them saying that, the person who bought it and saw that ad, they're like, oh, what is, I could make this sound sort of like a violin, you mm -hmm. know, um, and how would I do that? And how does that change the way that I'd approach the instrument? Which obviously it did. I mean, there's. Yeah. I mean, without distortion, I don't think we'd have a lot of the stuff that we do today. And oh, sound. sure. The game thing just radically changed that. I wonder if there's going to be another breakout thing like that because your staple effects, you know, <laughs> uh, distortion, chorus, flange, wah, like those made such a huge impact across it. And yeah. now we don't really see that so much. Well, like, I think not I think there's effect. a well, the, one I think people just tinkered. You know, in the beginning they'd be like, huh, what does it sound like if I run that like with these, you know. I put a capacitor here. I'm going to create a filter. I'll do this thing. What happens? Like, if I do that, you know, and then they do did that, and they're like, oh, that's kind of an interesting sound. There's probably a bunch where they're like, that, not that good. Um, but there's really only so many electrical components. Like, we really yeah. only have capacitors, inductors, resistors, um, and then even like semiconductors are really just like sort of like resistors or switches. Um, that's really all they really do in a way. Um, so, yeah, there's there's not a lot of variation of electrical po components. Mm. <clears throat> um, but we, like, think of everything we've made. Like everything you see, and you know, your computer and stuff's all made with basically like three or four different things. Um, <laughs> you know, your TV screen. All, all like it's crazy. It's amazing what we can do with so little in a way. Um. So yeah, I, I don't know if there will be anything like particularly new or not. I don't know. I, it, I mean, we'll when we see it, we'll see it. Yeah, <laughs> it's one of those things. That, like there was a one guy that uh, popped up in my feed that had like a rotating guitar neck. But it was basically a baseball bat. With yeah, string. I saw that. <laughs> there's, there's zero utility. It's a neat gimmick, but you yeah. would never be able to play the thing. The angle like makes stuff next to impossible to 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 play. Uh, well, then you. I mean, I don't think you could call that a guitar anymore, right? No. Like, I don't know what it is. If the lute <laughs> is not a guitar, then that's definitely not a guitar, right? Like, you know what I mean? Sure. Absolutely. It, yeah. it, like, you start to really get. Well, I think you know it's tuning the amount of strings, the yeah. and and that type of thing in it because it's like, you know, we have ten string guitars, but you could argue that's a not a guitar as well to an extent because sure. of the range and so on, or a ten string bass, which is the same th same thing. It's like how do you de designate? Yeah, what a, where's the line? Why is so? Why is a mandolin not a guitar? Because it's got eight strings, and it's tuned different. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I don't know. That's a, that's a, 
That I would say that. I mean, I, I think we know. Like we can say, "Oh, I know that's a mandolin," but it's not. But like, yeah, as the guitar sort of thing keeps expanding to encompass so many different variations. Yep. Yeah. Like, is it? Well, when does it stop being a guitar? Is it? Yeah. And then you say, well, tuning, but obviously there's a lot of people use all kinds of alternate tunings, and that's generally accepted, or it is accepted yeah. as norm. Yeah, pitch range, but again, you run into the issue of, okay, if it's range of pitch, there's a lot of lay- uh, crossover with that. Um, you know, even, what is it, Dev- oh, Devin Townsend's new model yeah. is pretty freaking sweet looking. It does look sweet. Yeah, I'm like, that's kind of cool. And there's a 32 fret version. I saw that. Which I did see like, somebody though. They're like, if you're gonna make so many frets on it, like you got to give some clearance to get your hand up there. But it, it doesn't have it. I don't know if you noticed that. Yeah, uh, uh, it didn't. It didn't give you enough space. Yeah, there's not enough. So you have to do way. like the classical guitar thing to get it to those frets. So it's kind of like it's for tapping on a, <laughs> so you can yeah. tap up higher. Who knows? At that point though, do the bumblefoot thing. Slap a thimble right. on and, and just tap it that way. Into determinacy. Let's get some Brower esque ideas with that it's funny to me how i used to always want all those frets and like i just i don't even like playing that high on the guitar anymore <laughs> Which is, i don't really it, like it, that range like past like the 15th fret or so i'm like it always just sounds so like wimpy and thin it, um, that, i think the thinness is a big turn off for it and i put it. i have like 13s on my guitars too. it's not like a string gauge thing yeah yeah um it just doesn't sound that great up there really um or at least it's it's not it's for an effect sure but um. yeah uh, and it but it's like you know the funny thing with the, the classical guitar is most of our music sits below the twelfth fret yeah and it's stupidly difficult so why like getting up above that uh, is. It, well, it's rare in the compositional space, but it's also like, what is the the? There's still more to explore down here. Sure. <laughs> you know, it was in the first. But call. but even you look at a lot of instruments, and they're really their practical range is two octaves. You know, um, and guitar has that in one position. So, mm-hmm. yeah, sometimes it's like, oh, I want to be able to play everywhere, which I do. But like, at the same time, sometimes I'm like, that's kind of stupid. Like. Because, like, if I'm learning, like, sax lines or something like that, like, you can just stay in one position and play most of that stuff. Like, you don't have to move around. I mean, maybe there might be a better fingering, like, if you shift. Yeah, that's what like, thi- like, playing Coltrane or whatever, like, I don't have... To, I can basically stay in a certain range on the instrument. I know where it is. And it's just effectively one position. Mm-hmm. Um, and it hardly ever goes higher or lower than that. So... But it, there's plenty of music there, I guess that's my point. Yeah. And, well, and that's the same thing, like, you know, I, I was talking with a student about it. I'm like, honestly, it's the first string that's designating what you're going to do in terms of position. Because those are your highest notes. Yeah. And that's all you're really reaching for is the higher ones. It, that's it. Because the vast majority, you know, outside of those four on the top string, yeah. thinking positionally uh, with that, it's like, you can play that I, anyway. I do think a lot of, like, my opinion of classical guitar, like, um choices on the the preferred like fingering locations a lot of it ends up being close to first position and i often think when i'm reading through i'm like this sounds so much better if you move it to seventh position or something which is funny because stanley yates was i watched a bit of an interview of him and alan marins the guy that did the a box cd recently yeah and you know, they're both Bach heads and totally into that. But one of the things that uh, Stanley remarked, he's like, we're different stylistically because uh, Alan likes to stay up in the seventh to ninth position, doing yeah. a lot of arpeggiation and using open strings to get lower notes. Yeah. Type of thing. And Stanley's like, if I can get to the first position, I'd, I'd jump to it whenever I can. Yeah. You know, he's like, that's just you know, my thinking. So, I, yeah, like I, I feel like those, like, especially, like, say you had to play a high A, like the A on the fifth fret. Like, but if you ever want to milk it, like it's kind of hard to milk the notes on that E string. It just doesn't yep. come out as well. If you play that same A on the B string, mm-hmm. like Sounds you true. can really like, you could make that thing sing. You know, you can put a lot of, especially that location on the neck. Like you can really get a nice vibrato, like classical style vibrato, um, there that you just can't, you just can't do it on the fifth fret. So I'm always yep. like. This song's a little too pretty to be in first position, you know. Like yeah, well, this should this should be about, like yeah. up here. Like, you can really make this thing sing. I mean, I say that, and I'm not. I don't have any classical, or whatever. But 
Oh, you're right. I, I, I make my students do that. You know, I'll, I'll take them through simpler songs and be like, play this up in the fifth position now. Mm-hmm. Like, all the notes are available. And tell me why you would pick one or the other. Like, sure. get them to think in that mode of how, why, are you engaging the instrument just in terms of comfort or, or comfort? Comfort, yeah, that's it. <laughs> are you engaging the instrument in that position because of comfort, or are you making an aesthetic, a musically aesthetic choice of where you're playing the note to be able to give a certain amount of vibrato, to be able to give certain things that are not easily available in the other one, even though it might be quote unquote easier to play. Yeah. One of the things that I'm doing now, I just got it, uh, an arrangement of that sleep or uh, sheep may safely graze that uh, Mateus Kowalski was playing. I found the arrangement. And so I'm reading through it, and the guy has some really interesting choices, uh, the original transcriptionist. Uh, Mateus doesn't even follow everything that he's doing exactly, and I do the same thing. I'm like, eh, I kind of prefer it in these areas. But some of his fingering is just wildly different, like really weird. Um, that What I would pick, it works well. Like, yeah. it, it took me a couple of tries to be like, why is he doing this up here when I can, okay, all right. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. It makes sense. You know, I can see why he's doing it, and uh, it it gets it. And then I'm like, eh, I don't like it, <laughs> and I go back to another one, or whatever. And it, uh, but it's interesting to to get into that mode, uh, especially when you. I think it's a little bit easier with music that it wasn't intended for a guitar to begin with. Sure. Often when we write for the guitar, we'll be in a. We get, to, for lack of a better term, blinders on. It's like, yeah, it's only going to be played here, and that's it. Rather yeah. than taking a step back, and yeah, and it sort of takes advantage of that location, yeah. Uh, versus if I'm taking something from another instrument, you lose that. Uh, you lose the blinders because you can't do it with them on. You have right. to think of the entire range of things and how to get that going. There's a Scriabin yeah, prelude. Yeah, I, f- I feel like that about like all the Bach stuff. I'm like, this wasn't written for guitar. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and that's what I tell my students. I'm like, Bach is hard, mainly because he didn't write for the guitar at all. So there's nothing right. simple about it. Uh, you can get some harmonically thin stuff, you know, like the to, watching the cliche to bourre in E minor, right. you know, the the, uh, the lute suite, the 996. Right. Yeah, that's it. Um, that gets played to death by everybody being like, oh, I'm playing Bach. I'm good. It's like, uh, yeah. no. <laughs> no, but okay. Sure. I mean, technically, yes, you are playing the notes, but this is not. Yeah. You know, you're not. You're, oh, boy. I, I heard a version of that where the guy put it in five the other day. It was kind oh, of. Hold on. That's a cool idea. But it wasn't like he played on electric, you know, so it was like. Okay. It wasn't I meant mean, to be, but it was just. It, it was cool how he did it. He just basically added a beat at the end of every phrase kind of thing. But it sounded good, actually. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and it. It's recognizable enough that you you never lo- you know you don't lose it. So it's yeah, cool. yeah. Oh, that's a it's an interesting idea. Yeah, and he yeah, he like... said he was doing that like he would. There was other one he took, and like dropped a beat too. It was it was Spock though. Like instead of letting it hold or whatever, it he cut it off or cut off an eighth note or something. So that it it made it fall a different way. So it was cool. That's interesting. It's like, I remember uh, there's a piece by Britton for guitar and voice, Benjamin Britton, and it's in 7-8, but he's got a breath at the end of every bar. Okay. So it's like, how do you keep that convincingly 7 and not take that last breath to push it? Like getting into the symmetrical thing with that. And and clearly it it can be done and it's done, but it's just one of those intellectual conundrums uh, combining with the physical conundrum of playing the stinking thing because it's hard. And you have this extra breath on top of it, but you don't want to push it too far to eight. But at the same time, you got to keep seven nice and, uh, you know, stuff like that. So that was kind of like the it's back to the Sokovia thing real quick with the taking the guitar away. That's kind of the thing that I did with that one piece where that I wrote where I'm detuning all the strings. I should actually relearn that. <laughs> I think, you know, I never officially premiered it. My own work, Jim Marin pr- premiered it, but uh, it, uh, it, but that was the point. It's like I didn't want to actually play a piece that I was writing. I wanted to write it and be disconnected from the guitar. Sure. And that kind of came out. You know what I actually kind of enjoy is the uh, – and- I'm kind of switching subjects, but it's sort of in the same line as when people take like a Bach piece, whatever it was, or maybe a a, um, a suite or whatever of it, 
and then they do the variations of that they created afterwards you know or whatever so yeah. here's and then they usually make it more virtuosic or whatever um but i think it's cool i think it's a that's a kind of a nice way to um give homage by giving your own personal take um and, and you're calling it something different i can't remember what the what are those even called like when you do that the isn't there a name for that demon variations that would be my take I mean, on it I, th- I feel like there's another word that i'm thinking of anyway like isn't that that's kind of what, what Tope did in terms of learning composition in a roundabout way where he would take like phrase a and you know a phrase and take out the middle of it and be like okay how can i connect these and keep it coherent yeah like the other guys did and uh but it's a, this would be taking bach taking that virtue the uh original melodic content so you can at least recognize the tune and then yeah. slap it your own virtual yeah maybe you put a little different harmony or change it a little bit yeah there's yeah. the one i'm thinking of that's pretty cool in particular is that there's a hillary hahn video of her doing the paganini caprices or whatever but then she does this and she didn't do it she didn't write them but they, there's these variations on those and they were just awesome I've seen that yeah they, they they're, were just... they're like so cool they're cooler than the paganini pieces <laughs> if you thought that was hard wait till you see yeah that. and it's like insane yeah, yeah and she's that... like 17 or something when it's yeah but yeah. Uh, but in a good good crazy yeah way. No, it's, it's amazing incredible that there's a virtuosity you don't see on this instrument very often our instrument anyway I wonder if that is due to our consistent exposure to it or, and then we're looking at other instruments and being like, wow, you got all this other stuff. Or if that's a, a typical thing with each instrument player thinking of their own instrument, like where saxophone players like, ah, we kind of hit the wall in terms of virtuosity and pushing the thing, the saxophone quote unquote to the next level. Uh, are there, I don't know. That would be something that uh, now I'm thinking it's like I have topics to call my friends tomorrow on my drive. Uh, <laughs> yeah, do they do they think it's already been reached? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if it's any more than guitar players feel like it's been reached. Because a lot of, you know, guitar players, we always, there's certain people that you're like, I mean, you're never going to be Alan Holdsworth or you're never going to be Ben yeah. Wander or Michael Hedges or, you know, like they seem fairly unattainable. Um, You might be able to copy the sort of vibe of it, but you'll never you wouldn't be their equal by doing that, right? Um, Here's the, another thing on that. Oh, have you, do you need to finish that thought? Well, but I, I guess the only thing I say is that's what people feel like, you know, nobody's passing Coltrane or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. And then even like Brecker came out and he kind of has the coltrane thing, but then then you're like, well, he just sort of copied a lot of the Coltrane stuff, but it did it his own way. And uh so then, but then even Colt Brecker is like, well, uh, you can't top Brecker, you know. You could sort of do his thing, but then you just be a copy of him. And there's plenty of those people too. Um, Everybody's copying a copy of a yeah. copy. Copy, yeah, copy. Again, it, it, that goes to things that we talked about before, where information gets compressed. You know, it, it's like you can imitate Coltrane without having to go through the trenches to get to his uh to create that lick it's like he's already done it so you you reverse engineer it to an extent yeah. um and it, with every composer which is what we do we study people that are phenomenal and we go how do they do that right. and we take it apart and we tinker with it and we kind of, if we're good enough we come up with our own thing if we just like to even if we're not good enough it's something that is giving us enough information where we can push to the a different way with things and keep it to ask but not sure totally it. I always I always see that with the the Coltrane or the Holdsworth one kind of irks me a little. There's a lot of like I don't know how many a lot is. Maybe there's a thousand. <laughs> I don't know if that's a lot or not. Like sort of like I would say pseudo Holdsworth copy, um, where you can tell and they would tell you too that Holdsworth is their favorite guitar player and um, they've learned a lot of his stuff and then they use a sound that's very much like him and they play with songs that are very much like him and they might even learn a lot of his songs or whatever you know um which is all good but it, it, it what irks me is it's like well if you really wanted to be at holdsworth level then you should be i would think you should do a lot of the things that he did you know so like you probably should be listening to a lot of coltrane and debussy and like ravel and like really digging into that you should also probably 
map out all the possible scales and all that stuff that they say you know they say that he did and you should explore it yourself and find that out you should probably start learning how to tinker with uh amps and stuff like that because he was really into you know to get a sound that you want to you know like and like he played in a lot of pop bands and played in r&b bands and all these kind of things like you probably should do that too you know get that experience see what that's like um and because in my opinion that's what formed him you know it wasn't he didn't just find something that sounded exactly like him and then just copy it. Right? He he had to develop all of that um, yeah. by pulling his influences in and creating that thing. Same with, uh, actually I wrote this article thing about if you really like Bebop, um, I don't know if you ever read that or saw that, but like Charlie Parker was obsessed with Stravinsky and stuff like that so much so there's a pretty cool article about Stravinsky being at a Charlie Parker show and somebody told Parker that he was there and then in the middle of like a pretty complex like jazz tune I think it was confirmation like so crazy changes Charlie Parker started playing the themes from the Firebird suite in there and mixing it and apparently like a Stravinsky like he noticed and he like stood up and he was like cheer like cheering and like knocked all the glasses over or whatever and was like oh you're like giving him the big thumbs up because like like he was upset he was obsessed with it so it's like well could you really be that into bebop if you didn't spend a lot of time listening to Stravinsky and stuff like that like that that's part of it um you know yeah. you know and then yeah you could copy all of Bird's licks and you could and you, yeah you're gonna sound pretty much like it. But you're going to be missing, I think you're going to be missing something. And then I actually looked, like, all those cats were listening to that stuff. They were listening to Bartok and Stravinsky. And, like, um, there's a pretty cool Joe Henderson quote. And he's just like, yeah, he's like, that's just what was on. Like, that's what we listened to. That's, like, what we studied. Like, we, it was going on at the same time, you know, a lot of that stuff. That, yeah. they, that they were developing bebop. This sort of uh, 20th century style was either you know, it was pretty fresh, pretty new. And like, they were really into it. And the, these people were like, even socially, like the circles were sort of happening. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just sort of fascinating. So I don't know, you, you hear bebop and if from, from face value, you'd be like, I, I don't hear any Stravinsky in there. You might, you might think that, but if you listen and like, uh, you know, observed it closer, you would find a lot of that stuff in there because it was a huge inspiration for it. Um, I don't, there's no way to get around it. So I don't know. It's kind of, that, I don't know how I got to this exactly. I don't remember, but, but, uh, that's the places that we end up, but, yeah, yeah. but, uh, it, it, I thought it was just really sort of fascinating thing to think about. Oh, because we were talking about copy of a copy. It's like, yeah, if you really want to be Charlie Parker, you don't just copy out Charlie Parker's like, you probably should study the firebird suite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like that's part of it. Score study is so much fun too. It, it really oh, yeah. is. Like they said he would walk around like he had like Stravinsky scores like he'd be at the show with Stravinsky scores you know oh that's that cool. was just normal and he'd be that's what he'd be he'd practice it and like play through it and it's like yeah I mean why not he was fascinated by it mm -hmm. yeah so yeah again I that's like that's part of the journey yeah I gotta get, get my boss bust <laughs> but I mean, that might be like what if it'd be kind of interesting to see like okay you get into Bach but what was Bach listening to you know, like what inspired him. And then you start digging down that hole. Yeah. That would be interesting to see because he'd copied like a lot of his stuff in his early childhood. Uh, he was copying by hand, like yeah. taking violin books and just copying it. Sure. And, yeah. So what was it? What did, why did he pick those things? You know, as much as you could find out, that's like a, a Pat Martino comes off sounding very original. Um, he's like instantly noticeable, but if you listen to Billy Bean, who was also in Philadelphia, like Billy's not, he doesn't have quite as tight of a sound as Pat, but I mean, it's close. Like if I didn't tell you it was Pat Martina or I didn't tell you it was Billy Bean, you would be like, Oh, is that like an early Pat record or whatever? <laughs> like you wouldn't know. So it's like, well, that didn't like Pat's thing. And he, he wrote in the, one of his like second or third album, it, like there's a quote that said, I was inspired by these people in particular, these, you know, these certain people, uh, Dennis or, uh, Sandoli, the one, uh, he's a guy who taught like Coltrane and stuff like that too. Um, he studied with him and then, um, 
and Billy Bean was on there. It's like, okay, well, obviously he heard them and listened to a lot and probably got a lot of it, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, even people that you think are, like, so novel and unique, they, they're getting it from somewhere. I'm, I'm certain even Holdsworth or something, you know, you would find digging, you're going to find, oh, he got that from that sound and he heard that and that's why he did that. And, you know, you start, you could start piecing it all together. Um, so nothing's in a vacuum, but um, I think what happens in guitar and probably other instruments too is you start copying the guitar and that's sort of a problem. You end up just sounding oh. like, yourself or whatever you're but or it's, it's like the same exact style and you just do exactly the same style there's there's a sort of plainness to it that's not that great and that's kind of one of the things that i like i i've on and off and working on an instructional book you know just to kind of do yeah. the college professor thing of buy my book because right. you have you know it's sort of kind of kidding a- adjunct uh <laughs> yeah. um bonus <laughs> exactly the adjunct bonus that's a good way to put it uh-huh. i'm gonna use, i'm gonna call it that the adjunct what right. is, it's, it's, thanks for purchasing my adjunct bonus <laughs> um but the uh uh what was it the um the issues that I'm i'm looking at is like you know knowing what i know now how would i approach starting the instrument in a oh, new yeah. way how would i get how could I compress the 30 some odd years of training, you know, into uh, a different way to approach it so that you can pick up kind of where I'm at and then launch from there. And a lot of it has to do with like, it, well, fundamentally guitarists start out by imitating bands, looking at t- tabs and everything else. And it, yeah. you know, maybe I'm getting old and crotchety, but like I, I get more and more anti tab, the more, and more I get into it, the more, because it's like, all this is doing is teaching you patterns and you're not thinking in music. You're just thinking in patterns and you're yeah. th- the, way the patterns are toast, you know, to, to, to use the Marvin quote with Billy strings. It's like, just move the capo, <laughs> you know, sure. don't look, play the changes, move the capo, whatever. I don't think they have legitimate beef with them. I think they're just trolling really hard. Cause that's what Marvin does, but right. funny. Um, and they're not totally wrong either. That being said, if you're approaching the instrument from a pure note factor and yeah. looking at the spaces are the spots where the tones are generated, how uh, how much further can you get in thinking of notes rather than just a guitar? Because I guarantee you, that's in one sense, that's what Holt, that's how Holdsworth thought. He wasn't thinking of guitar shapes. He was sure. like, oh, I want these notes. Boom, and here it is. No matter how weird and obnoxious the stretch was. Uh, and... If we can lose that guitar way of thinking, for lack of better terms, where would the instrument go? You know, in yeah. one sense, you uh, uh, Mancu- uh, Matthias Mancuso taking the instrument to the nth degree because he just didn't know any better and he just did it. Sure. So is this vast ability or vast availability of guitar tab and uh, stuff like that that's out online more of a hindrance to the creative thing than uh ultimately than, oh absolutely and, and that you know it's like i mean I, yeah i completely agree it's like yeah it's absolutely a hindering uh, hindrance yeah it's well I, I think i think it like so one thing i've noticed from learning other instruments and getting into that the expectation is so much higher on every other instrument in terms of when you start like you get just know all the keys like i don't it's less than one we're going to start learning all the keys. Like mm-hmm. you're going to play an F sharp. Like one of the things you're going to have to do is play an F sharp major. And you got to start next week. Of all you know, the keys, F sharp major. Sure. I'm just whatever. saying like, it's part, like it's just part of the literature. Yeah. Um, I, I was looking around cause I, I saw it today. I guess I didn't grab it, but I have Suzuki book one for violin. I mean, you should see the stuff that like, oh, most yeah. good, no, like I so have... many guitar players don't even play that. Like they can't even play it. It's like that. That's book one. Like there's, I think there's seven, isn't there? I can't remember how many. Nine. It's like you start. They're like real songs. They're like real melodies. There's sharps and flats. There's weird rhythms. Now the way you teach it isn't just for them to read it or whatever. So it's a little, little more nuanced than that. But it's like they get into that as a little kid, 
for the first time playing violin. Like that's that's how they're learning. You know, yep. like that the expectation is so much higher. I've had two students. I mean, I'm not Suzuki certified, so you know, asterisk around that. But I value the books and the pacing that it goes through. Yeah. Like, like, and the two students that I've took through the first three books <laughs> are absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Like, not scared of anything. You can throw it in front. Oh, okay, that's this. That's this. That's this. That's this. And uh, this one student, she's f- brilliant. Like, you know, she's like harmonically analyzing stuff without me looking over her shoulder to do it. She was like, oh, yeah, that's because this G is going to this and is tonicizing this. And I'm like, I mean, I know you've heard me talk in these terms, but who's, who, who else are you listening to? But she's like using that as a, a jumping board. Right. She's doing f- fantastic. And the same thing with this other. And they're both one of them's nine and the other one. Oh, no, they're both nine. They're both nine. I started right. them both when they were one of them started when they were four and the other one started when they were like five. Uh, five or six <clears throat> and there the potential for both of them is to be absolutely huge sure you know, and it's like just keep going keep doing that yeah, I, I think the nice thing about that is it it doesn't make it seem like so complicated it just yes. it just is it what is. it is it's just music exactly. it's just music but when you come at it when you come at music from an understanding of tablature and patterns yeah it's totally foreign because it wrecks that mold it doesn't give yeah. you that I mean, you get people that have been, I mean, we all know, right? You get people that have been playing guitar, maybe even in bands and stuff for 30 years. And like they still won't read or they, maybe they learned the notes sort of. And they're like, they're so intimidated by it. It's just like this. That blows my mind. And you can't, you can't even, con- I mean, they, even when they're like, I want to do it. They put such a block in their head somewhere along the line. that It's oh. practically impossible to teach them to do it because they won't. It'll always be hard. Like yeah. even though it's not hard, it'll yeah, always it, be hard. They're they're just mentally it's like this is the hardest thing I've ever tried to do. Yeah. It's like, and you can't do that. And that's the thing. It's like I tell when I get students that yeah, I want to learn how to read music, I'm like, then that's all that you're gonna do. Like you can't I wanna to learn to read music, but give this to me in tab. It, yeah. It's not gonna work. I, I wanna to learn to read music, but I'm gonna look at this little thing to help me because I don't recognize these particular things. Yeah. Or like in the sense of like I'm not sure where these notes are being played, so I'm gonna look at the tablature. It's like no, it's got to be nothing but that. And yeah. it's got to be separate from the guitar to a small extent. Like give them violin books, give them horn books, give them other things that get you thinking in notes rather than this lays on the guitar in a certain pattern. Yeah. Some stuff crosses over. Like a C major scale is going to be patterned on a guitar the same way it's going to be patterned everywhere else. That being said, where the notes lay out, you can play that dozens of ways, or maybe sure. not dozens, a ton of ways on the guitar, depending on what position you want to do it in. And this is where you should be thinking in terms of the notes and putting them there and be like, I'm going to play these notes here. Yeah. That's one of the things I like about these arrangements of the box that I just got. It's like, okay, he's playing stuff in honestly he's up between the seventh and 12th fret yeah in places that you could totally put it down below the seventh fret in the second position without even thinking about it but it's like up there and i get why because it just sounds great (laughs) the thickness of the strings and that uh, the the timbre is fantastic um but the uh overall if your approach is coming it's like oh it's too hard these other things are easy it's like well you're right on these other two things are easy Hmm. like board charts and tablature but it's not too hard you're i i, I mean if i'm going to be so bold it's like you're just lazy at it i mean yeah i mean it's it's uh, it's actually really easy i mean ultimately you can show somebody how to read in 20 minutes you know or less five minutes it's, and then and it's that, just, then it's just a matter of like just getting proficient at it but you the word the words of it aren't very hard no not at all and every <clears> single <throat> pianist or any other instrumentalist that has come to the guitar yeah a complete beginner, but has a sight reading experience, flies through yeah. it. Like w- the, the goals that I have set up for a semester, they do within a, a couple of weeks. Well, maybe not that much, but you know, it's yeah. like. But the, you get the guitar players that have never read a note before and put the notes in front of them. It's like pulling teeth, you know. Well, and even, yeah, even like learning the the notes on the fretboard and like really knowing it. <clears throat> I always give this antidote, and I I can't remember if I've ever told you about this or said it on here. But like Jocko, the great bass player, maybe you know one of the greatest yeah, bass players it, it, ever. It, 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 is, 
tone. You're, you know, I'm never yeah, so like he plays bass the first time. Like his dad, he finally gets one, and his dad's just like, "Yeah, you better. I'm gonna be gone for two weeks or whatever. If when I get back, you better know every note on this thing, or I'm gonna beat your ass or whatever." <laughs> you know, yeah, so whatever. It's I like up, so. Right? I, I so I've told people that like um, in lessons, I'm like, you know, if somebody you know threatened you in a certain way that was you know you really believe them could you learn all the notes in the fretboard this week and really know them and they're like yeah i think i could it's like yeah of course you could yeah it's so then what then what is it like so you you not doing it is your choice to not do it i'm not saying it's going to be easy I'm, it's going to be tedious and it's going to be a pain yeah. and you're going to make mistakes and all that stuff but you'll fix it and the tedious is a big thing that I push. I'm like, I know it's tedious, <clears throat> but these are the things that are going to get you better. So what do you want to do? do you yeah, like, just... Or if we were like, hey, I'll, g- I'll give you a million dollars if you learned all these notes. Yep. <laughs> like, and you have three, you have two days to do it. Could you or do you... it? Could you do it? Of course you could do it. Yeah. And I do the same thing with learning to play a particular passage correctly. I'm like, take this tempo. Tempo doesn't matter. You can go slow yeah. as you want. No mistakes. Five thousand dollars on the line for this bar. Could you do it? And I, ninety-nine percent of the students, unless they just don't really just don't give a damn, nail it right then. They go slow. They're focusing on, and I'm like, the bottom line is, is you're just not focused. That's it. Yeah. That's all. And it. I mean, it, it, can that be a shitty thing to learn about yourself? Yes. But I don't look at that as a negative because it's like, okay, now I know where my weak point is. I can beat the hell out of it to fix it right. and get better. That's great. I'll take the win. You know, do it. Get Mancuso'd up. I don't know. <laughs> so... well, you know. I mean, you know, sometimes you start a piece or whatever, and you're like, I don't have any idea. Like, when you first look at it, you're, you're kind of like, okay, I, I don't know how I'm going to pull this off. Like, this seems impossible. But then somewhere along the line, after a couple of days or weeks or whatever it is, you start to look at it, and you're like, that that's not even hard anymore. But like there was a point where like it seemed literally impossible, but you just have to get past it. It's like the F chord, right? Like <laughs> yeah, the bar chord. The, the main like <laughs> the thing that's probably made more people quit guitar than anything else. Um, <laughs> you know, is it hard for you to play an F chord now, Adam? Do you yeah. even like like do you even think right. about it? Like it's like the least hard yeah. thing to do. It, it's a nice break from some of the stuff I have to play. <laughs> yeah, like it's like nothing. <laughs> But yeah, at one point in your life, you're like sweating that, like you, it was impossible. Yep. And not so easy. So I think that kind of yeah, there's a, there's a, there's pretty much all like that. I think there's probably nothing that wouldn't be like that in music. Yeah, um, agreed. Too. Yeah. It's the way that it goes. Okay, so do we wrap things up here, or do we try yeah, to? Yeah, probably one? wrap it up. I'll wrap been it up. Going going for a while. Yep. We lose track of time, which is good. Yeah. Because there's a lot to talk about. So we're back. So be glad. Uh, thank you for coming along on that semi-random journey. Right. <laughs> AI. We'll, we'll, we'll tighten it up over the next couple times. Yeah. We're excited. Not... We're excited to do this. It's been too long. It has been. We have a growing audience. So. Okay. All right. Thank you all for listening. We'll Please. catch you. Later.